Hi, my name is Jim Clover. I'm a certified athletic trainer, and today our, this section is going to be on modality. What do you see in this picture? Well, if you look in the bottom corner there, you're going to see an ankle that's kind of bent. Well, you can't really ice this thing and make it better. What I see when I see an injury like this has to do with what happens from here. In other words, now I start the modality process. Things like, I'm going to have to choose a modality for this. Is the modality safe for the use of this type of injury? Where the use of the modality contributes significantly to the rehabilitation process and the total recovery of the person. Is a person applying the modality train authorized to use this type of thing? In other words, is they a PT, an ATC, is it a student trainer? Do they have the correct background to be able to use these kind of things? Then you run into things like a muscle spasm pain cycle. This has to do with involuntary shortening of the muscle resulting from a trauma or a decrease in the oxygen. Have you ever woken up in the morning and you have a cramp in your leg? This is what we're talking about here. Or you see some athlete run along the sideline and the next thing you see is that they're pulling up with a cramp. What's going on is that it's the shortening of the fibers and a decrease of O2 from the spasms then causes a mechanical and chemical pain uh, problem with the fibers. This then is a very circular thing because you have the pain and the spasm and the body's trying to protect the area and then you keep on going round and round and round. Now your job as a clinician is to go ahead and try to solve some of these. One of the first things you're going to do is do a thing called cryotherapy. Now cryotherapy and what we would call it normally would be called ice. Uh, but you don't get paid for using ice, you, use, you get paid for using cryotherapy. This will decrease the amount of swelling to an area. Now say for example that we have this thing here and we get trauma, we get hit here. We get hit on the side of this thing and then when you get hit on the side you have something like this which causes trauma. If you look in there we have the trauma. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and apply ice to the outside and now poop, it's gone. Okay, now what you're going to do, some of the guidelines that you're going to have to have for cryotherapy, except for ice massage, which is also a form of heat, which we'll talk about later, cold modalities require the use of a barrier, such as a towel. Uh, most ice you put in like an ice bag, and that's also a barrier, because you don't want it directly on the skin. A lot of times you'll use these cold packs that you buy in the stores, the blue packs, those can almost burn you. In fact, they will. Or the chemical cold packs have been known to get little small holes in them and cause you uh, a significant burn. This applies to the, both the ice and reusable cold packs, like I said. You have to understand that sometimes these things get below freezing and that you can hurt somebody. So you have to have some, something there between. Never apply any form of cold on an open wound that is not protected. So say, for example, which does happen, a guy goes running along and then they fall, uh, they trip over a hurdle, and now they have an abrasion over the top and you want to put ice on it, put a little uh, four by four piece of gauze on top of that before you put the ice on it. It's just a good idea. The other thing I like to tell you also with ice is say for example you have a kid and he just tripped over something and he broke his clavicle. Now you want to put the ice on it to decrease the swelling and edema but if the weight of the ice causes more problems then we're probably not going to put that big old hunking piece of ice on there. Okay, never apply any kind of ice on something that where the athlete has no feeling. So say for example out of surgery sometimes they have different areas of the body that are numb. If you put ice on that and they can't feel that, then that could cause problems also. So, so think about that. Except for a vapo coolant spray, do not apply any cryotherapy. Now in patients would have decreased circulation such as diabetes or any kind of cardiac condition. Some other things to monitor. There's a thing called Raymond's phenomena, which is a condition where the arteries and arterioles become extremely constricted when you apply ice. It's almost like they're allergic to ice. In fact, that's what it looks like. It almost looks like they have uh, kind of a rash when you put the ice on them. That's why with any patient that you have, you have to go back and ask them continually, how are you doing? Any problems? Check and see if they do have any kind of situation like this. This would be with heat, with ice, or any kind of electrical modality that you run into. So all the time, you're going to go back and check on it. Symptoms of this would be, like I said, blue or gray or purplish co color. Uh, the fingers and toes, if you pinch them, you will not be able to see the color come back. And they'll have like a tingling sensation. Those are all things. The other thing when you pinch your fingers is say, for example, if I put ice, with ice you're going to also use ice compression elevation. And if you have the ACE wrap on or the elastic wrap too tight, you always want to come back and make sure that you have circulations also. And one of the ways to do that is to pinch the finger and make sure that they do have blood coming back. If they don't, it's too tight. Also, a simple thing is just to ask them. People forget about that sometimes. If any of these symptoms do come up, 
make sure that you let the patients know and then also contact the, the, their physician because the physician will also want to have this information so if they do send them someplace else that they'll have that information and they can tell the therapist or the athletic trainer that hey we better not do this anymore. Um, to avoid any further injury to the tissue always monitor the time of how long you keep the ice on. Now this is huge. Uh, and I, what I do with my patients uh, all the time is I do what's called crayon therapy. I'm going to write it out in crayons so that they totally understand. I also make sure that they repeat what I told them. Repeat what I told them. How many times you've gone to the doctor's office and you have no idea what he said when you left or you're listening but you're not paying any attention. You leave the ice on it from anywhere to from 15 to 30 minutes and then it's off for an hour and then you put the back, ice back on. If you put the ice on it for an hour, what's going to happen is instead of causing the swelling to decrease, it's going to cause an increase of swelling and you're going to take that, that three day injury out and you're going to make it a five to seven. So you need to be aware of those things. Ice packs. Ice packs we use all the time everywhere we go. Uh, when I go to a game, depending on what kind of game it is, I'm going to have a whole big old cooler full of ice packs. And this would be the first thing you're going to do. As you see with this patient, this very young and beautiful patient, which is my daughter, we're going to go ahead and put ice on the top and we're going to go ahead and elevate. So ice, compression, elevation. As soon as you take the ice off, we want you to go ahead and put an ACE wrap around the area to make sure that you keep the edema away. As we go through these sessions, you're going to have some, uh, some other little key hints that we're going to use also. So say, for example, when we take the ice off, we're going to put some foam pads around both the medial and lateral malleolus so that the swelling does not come back to those areas. Okay, one of the, the most widely used modalities that we have is ice. Uh, we're going to use this after an injury uh, acutely, but then we'll also use it, say, after practice. Say if they had like a tendonitis or some kind of inflammation. In this case, we have uh, Jenna just sprained her ankle, and we're going to go ahead and put ice underneath it. And then we'll also put ice on top of it. Now, the, um, to put ice directly on top of it, people always question that. But what you have here is that you have the plastic from the bag that acts as an insulation. And we'll talk more about the different problems that you can run into with ice. But the situation here, we're going to go ahead and ice her down for 15 to 20 minutes, and then off for an hour. Very good modality gets rid, once again, it causes vasoconstriction, gets rid of the edema. Now, what we want to do, like I said to begin with, is we have ice, compression, elevation. So now we're going to go, we're going to go the next level up. Now this is called intermittent compression. On this machine we show right here in this picture, it's a Job's machine, and what it does, it pumps air into it, and it adds compression around the whole body part. There's another machine that we're going to show right now, it's called a Game Ready. What it does is adds the ice and compression, and then you can also add the elevation. And you're talking about changing the difference between a three-day injury into a seven-day injury. You want that three-day injury to get back into play. This is a great idea how to do it. As you know, all modalities will either increase or decrease the edema and swelling. What we did here, what we're going to do today, is she has a little bit of edema and swelling in her knee. And this is game ready. What this does, this provides cold and compression at the same time. It's a slick modality. It works for different areas of the body. We can work for the knee. We also have one that's kind of fun for, this works for an ankle, and then we have them for the shoulder, shoulder, and other parts of the body. Anyhow, so what we're going to do here today is we're going to put this around her knee. Up, Sheba. Uh, this goes around her knee like this. And you also make sure that you let the patient know ahead of time that you know, what could happen with each modality. So, uh, Jenna, this could get cold. This part here sticks right in here like this until it clicks. Um, just to make sure that this doesn't come off, we go ahead and we add some extra seat belts to this thing so that it doesn't come off midway through here because there's some pretty good compression that comes through here. And all this edema will then float out. Um, as far as the modalities out there right now to get rid of edema, this is probably one of the better things that you can do. Okay, so now we have this. We tell her, we've already warned her exactly what's going to happen, so she's excited about that. If you look in the side of here, we have some ice and water, and this is what's going to go uh, circulate through here. And this can get, um, uh, freezing is 32 degrees. We won't get any clo very close to that. We'll get maybe down to 36. So we'll go to uh, power, and that's the first thing that occurs. Once we have that, the adjustments that we have here, we can adjust so we can read it uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit. We can have a, a bell timer on this thing, and then we can do the pressure. And we, she's got quite a bit of edema in there, so what we're going to do is we're going to shoot the, the pressure up as much as we can. We can also adjust the time here, 
and then we take it off to off of pause and now what it's going to do is going to go on and off and this temperature as you can see is starting to drop right now it's at 42 degrees the treatment length on something like this is anywhere say 15 to 20 minutes you can do this right after practice or you can use this as a modality after you do all the rehab um, it's a very good modality. We use it all the time right now. It's, with the thing that's nice about it now, you can pick it up and move it. It also um, has batteries in it, so you can take it right to the sideline of an event. And like I said, we'll get this down to about 34 degrees, and we'll leave it on for a substantial amount of uh, time. And what we've already learned is that with cold, initially it's going to be a burning kind of a uh, pain cycle, and then eventually in about three minutes it'll get numb, and she won't worry about it so much. But right now she's probably going through that cold part. Other than that, this is game ready. It's an excellent modality, and we'll go on and look at some more. Okay, what we're going to do is I'm uh, also going to show you how to use one for her ankle. So I've removed her shoes, and so now we're going to go ahead and attach this, just like we did with the other one, right in there. And this, for a sprained ankle, this is the difference between getting them back in a week and a half and three days. Go ahead, lift your leg up. Up, Sheba. Back down. It just lassoes right around here like this. This is one size fits all. She has a, a small size 12 here. Put that there. And once again, for added support so this thing doesn't come undone, is we just go ahead and put this around like this. And you can just do this in your kind of your basic figure eight kind of a deal. And once again, we go back to the knobs and we just go ahead and hit the power on. And once again, we go down to the uh, cold as we can because that will ensure that that ankle gets cold. And this will also, like I said before, it adds compression and it goes around all the whole ankle and we get around those malleoluses and pushes that edema right out. It's a fabulous uh, way to do it. Now, with any cold modalities, you're also going to have to kind of warn them ahead of time because if you've never had cold on before, if you initially put it on, it's going to cause a little bit of pain. So let them know that initially there's going to be a little pain, then eventually within the three minute mark, it's going to get numb. And that's kind of what we're going for. And once again, we're not going to go any further than say 20 to 30 minutes. Ice immersion is another one of those things that's wonderful that we're going to go ahead as soon as they sprain their ankle. Baseball players, as soon as they get done, they get done throwing those that, that four innings of baseball, we want to go ahead and ice their elbow down. This is a great way how to do that. Okay, this is um, ice slush we're going to do with Jenna right now. And of all the modalities that you have, this is probably one of the most uncomfortable. But essentially it works very good because right after somebody sprains their ankle, if you have the opportunity, you want to go ahead and fix some ice and water and uh, have them stick their ankle in there. And once again, what, what you have to explain to the patient is initially it's going to seem a little bit cold and it'll burn, it'll be a little pain, but then eventually it'll get to a point where it'll be uh, numb and it won't bother you that much at all. You can also, for patient comfort, if you'd like, you can put like there's a neoprene sleeve or cap that you can put over the toes, which keeps it more comfortable. In this situation, we don't have that today. But go ahead, Jenna, stick your foot in there. And some of them, they don't like to do this, so you may have to help and just as they stick their foot in there. As you see, it's not going to be real comfortable for the patient right now. But, and she knows and she's really concerned that we know that within the first minute to two minutes, it will then get numb and then she'll feel fine about it. So once again, it's a nice slush. Temperature is it's 45 degrees. Okay, once again, as we go through these things, one of the things that's nice about this format is that this information is also in your book, and you can also, like we're recording this thing, you can play it back. I seem like I talk a little fast. Well, TiVo it, and then you've got a chance to listen to it again. Now, ice massage. One of the biggest problems I, I tell my patients with ice massage is it's cheap. In other words, people think that because it's cheap, it must not be good. Ice massage is one of the best modalities for like a tendonitis. You have somebody that has an elbow tendonitis, a bicep tendonitis, a patella tendonitis. You take an ice cube, you, uh, or you take water, you put it in a styrofoam cup, you reel off the top, and for seven minutes you put on that area. It's an excellent, excellent modality for any kind of tendonitis. Uh, Vapo coolant spray. This is aerosol cooler. Say for example, you have a muscle that's tied, a hamstring, a back. And what you do is you follow the, the back fibers and this will help to decrease the pain and it will also kind of get rid of some of the spasm that you run into. It's a great modality to, to use. Whirlpools. Whirlpools are everywhere. 
Uh, this is a therapeutic bath that can either be with hot or with cold. It has water circulating around. It helps to cause some of the edema to be pushed out. It works really, really good. Also, say for example that you have an open wound or a cut, you can also use this in a sterilized situation. It'll help to clean out the, the area. Now when you look at whirlpools, you have like a cold whirlpool, which is anywhere from 55 to 65 degrees, where a hot whirlpool is anywhere from 100 to 110 degrees. Uh, those things you pretty much have to stick with that. That's with the extremity. If you do a total body, you're going to have to get down a whole lot less because that you could, eventually what you're thinking about is if you have a total body in this whirlpool, all the blood leaves, his, leaves their head and comes down the body and the next thing you know they're passed out. That's not a good idea. Warm whirlpool. Warm whirlpool is one that they always love as compared to the cold, right? Um, and what we do, this is uh, about 102 degrees right here. Uh, it goes anywhere from 98 to 102. Uh, most generally it doesn't go too much hotter than that. This will get the muscles warm before an activity um, or this also works uh, part of the rehab, uh, later part of the rehab, like once you've got rid of the edema. So what we're going to do first is go ahead and uh, Kayla's going to show you this. Say for example if she sprained her ankle, she would go ahead and one of the problems you run into is your Achilles gets tight. Your Achilles, which the two muscles attached to that are the gastrocnemius and the soleus. So go ahead, Kayla, turn around and what we're going to do here is we are going to stretch out the soleus and gastroc. With the leg straight, it's the gastroc. With her leg bent, it's the soleus. And she would go ahead and hold that from anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds. Kind of a great way to stretch because you get the warm, the, the water, and you get the flexibility. Go ahead and keep it straight. Perfect. So this would be one, and then you have also the basic thing with Jenna's doing, and she's just going through a range of motion, and she can also do the alphabet. And then we've, go, we've added some other things, and I'm going to turn the jacuzzi off here, and I'll show you how this works. The things we want to do initially is whenever you sprain a ligament, you stretch the ligament. Once you stretch the ligament, the ligament never goes back to where it was to begin with. So what you have to do, you have to make the muscles strong around it. There's two things that keep the integrity of any joint together. As you know, one is the ligaments and the other are the muscles. So what I've done is I come up with, come up with this modality called balloonatonics. Wonderful name. And uh, since this is a warm whirlpool, we'll go ahead and use a red balloon. And you blow it up, but not a whole lot. And then you pinch it in half. And this might be too big too, really. And what you can do, give me a foot, Jenna. And, and she's going to grapple onto this thing, and then she's going to put it in the water and try and hold on to it. And now she has a resistance. Now she'll move her toes around, up and down and around. And what this does, this also works the muscles around it very well. And depending on how much, you put air, how much air you put in there will, will increase the resistance. You can also do this in a cold whirlpool or a cold bath right after the initial injury. Works very, very good. And there's a learning curve to this. Plus, this works all the appropriate exceptions along with it also. As you can also see what she's doing now, she can do her leg up and down. And this also works with the quadriceps and hamstrings. Fire's pretty good. It's harder than it looks, doesn't it? The thing that's nice about the balloonatonics is we have it hooked onto the foot right now, but I can also do an upper body whole workout, hold on to balloon, go every different direction I went with a shoulder. And I can also get them in the swimming pool behind us, and we could do a whole exercise uh, with bigger uh, motions. So I could grab onto the bottom of her foot, she can stand in the swimming pool and go abduction and adduction, hip flexion, hip extension, do every range of motion that there is just with the use of balloons. So you talk about a cheap modality, there's, just, there's some, not much cheaper than just your basic balloon. And once again, I use the red one for the warm whirlpool and I'll use a green one for the cold whirlpool just to kind of psych these kids out. You have to admit, I'm pretty quick to be able to run down in the clinic change clothes and then come back to here. This is amazing, just to, just to think about that. Now, always remember, when do you change from hot to cold? You go from the cold to the warm when the swelling has completely subsided and stopped. If you go too quickly, then once again, it's gonna cause that baby to swell up more and then you're gonna run into worse problems. Also, always tell your patients that, say for example, if they just sprained their ankle, tell them to put ice on it and also tell them not to heat it up because otherwise they're going to have a grandma or grandpa or somebody else down the street says go home and, and put in Epsom salts, a nice good Epsom salts bath. bath. And what that's going to do, that's going to make it worse. Now we're going to go ahead to a contrast bath. Now what happens here is the cold causes things to vasoconstrict and the heat causes things to vasodilate. So let's go ahead and look at the video and see how this really works out. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, the initial part of the 
uh, rehab is done, the first 48 to 72 hours or until the swelling has completely subsided or stopped. Now we're going to go in, uh, do a contrast bath. What, what happens here is we have a cold bucket and a warm bucket. And the cold causes a vasoconstriction. In other words, the blood will be pumped out. And the warm causes a vasodilation, which will increase the blood flow. So it should go back and forth to one to four ratio. The first thing Jenna will do is go ahead and stick your foot in the cold. So stick her foot in there for about 30 seconds. Once again, this is something with the patients that do this, you can tell because when they stick their foot in the ice, it's no big deal. If they haven't, if you tell them to go home and do this, and they, they're supposed to do it three times a day, and they come back the next day, and it's like the first time they ever did it, you can tell right off the get-go. It never occurred by their face. Go ahead and stick your foot in the warm now. She'll love that part of the thing. See, she's happy with the warm, and we'll do this for two minutes and then 30 seconds. Uh, but just to kind of get a feel for back and forth so you, so you know the rotation, we'll go ahead and stick your foot back in the cold so they know that this is the cold. Uh, this is the part she likes the best. We want to make sure it gets in there. And if it starts to warm up, you can stir that ice around. That way it'll make sure that it stays nice and cold, and then she'll just go back into the warm. Once again, this is a contrast. Works great as far as moving that edema out of there. Oh, the cold was really kind of uncomfortable, but now you do the contrast. These people are going to love you. The ice makes everything vasoconstrict and it's cold, then you stick it in the warm. Oh, that's not real comfortable. But without question, our goal is to try to speed up Mother Nature. And one of the best ways to do that is to go ahead and help to pump that blood out of there. Now we're to a more kind of a comfortable part. This is the heat aspect of it. When you have this, make sure that you never apply heat to any areas where there is a loss of sensation once again, because uh, burns could occur. They have to have all their sensations. If you put something on somebody that's not like that, then you could burn them, and that's a real concerning factor. Never apply heat uh, immediately after an injury, which we've talked about before, but I can't tell you how important it is to re-emphasize this all the time. Never apply heat over uh, top of your eyes or genitalia because you could have a burn effect. So make sure that you don't do those kinds of things. Never apply heat over a patient that could be possibly pregnant because you could hurt the fetus. These are things that you don't want to do. Make sure that you understand these things. Never apply heat on any kind of an open wound or any kind of malignancy. These things are problems that we could run into. Make sure that you do know what the physician wants you to do. Whenever you put heat or cold on somebody, you make sure that you do talk to their doctor. Make sure that if they have any kind of uh, diabetes or any kind of history that heat affects them weirdly, should we say, uh, that you want to know those things so that you don't hurt anybody. Uh, that's all in the introduction. In other words, that my name's Jim Clover. I want to put this hot pack on you. Uh, I'm going to put these towels on it first, and then I'm going to come back every once in a while and make sure that everything's fine. The worst thing in the world, you as a clinician, would be is to come back and that you uh, cause more pain to your uh, patient. That would be a bad thing. So, okay, uh, what we're going to do now is warm uh, modalities. This is a hydroculator. Hydroculator is one of those, once again, it's very widely used. Um, and we'll use it for anywhere 15 to 20 minutes before practice. Uh, as compared to post-practice, uh, we'll use the ice. Another warm modality that you can use that everybody has access to is a hot shower. So what we can do here is, first of all, we'll go ahead and put like a towel on in between the hydroculator pad and her. These hydroculators are like in a water base kind of a deal, and then we pull them out. And then from there, we'll go ahead and put them inside one of these sleeves because they can get too hot. The thing that's very important about this is we come back and we check with our patient, make sure that it's not too hot and that it's comfortable for her. Because these, like anything else, you could burn somebody. We really don't want to do that. So we'll go ahead and leave that on there. Kayla, everything fine? Nice and warm? Okay. We'll leave it on there for 15 to 20 minutes. And then after this, we could go ahead and start our exercise program. But this is what we're going to do for uh, before practice. The thing that's nice about these also is we can also, they have different sizes and different looks for this. This is a cervical one. And as you can see, it's more based around the neck. And it also has a little towel hamper kind of a deal that you can put it inside of and this fits easier around her neck and so for her shoulders and her back to keep her nice and warm up there we can use that and it you can also use for around her leg or other places too but as you can see there's different types of hydroculators for different parts of the body once again it's a very great modality for uh, areas that you want to get warmed up that last one is, is extremely fun to do. Once again, you have to make sure that you don't have any open wounds in any of these modalities we're talking about currently. Now, the next one is a paraffin bath. This is very comfortable also, but the thing is you have to be aware, and I'm going to tell you again, is that you could burn somebody with this. So make sure that you pay very close attention to this next video.
this is a paraffin bath. Also, this is another one of our warm modalities. The thing that's nice about this, it gets a lot hotter than, a, say, a warm whirlpool, but it also gets in the crevices. So this works great for like a wrist or a hand or a finger or even an ankle. Uh, what you're going to do, or what she's going to do, you have paraffin in here with uh, some oil, and she'll go ahead and stick her hand in here and then stick it back out. And then she'll make, let it dry for a second. Make sure it dries away. It's easy, it's easy to tell if it dries or not because it turns white. And go ahead and back in. And for what we're doing here, we're just going to do it mainly for her fingers. That's what we're trying to do here. We're going to have her dip about 10 different times. So go ahead and go again. And the thing that we look for here essentially is we don't want them to keep any residual wax in their hands. So they dip it like this and they got a puddle in their hand. That would be wrong. And we want their fingers to be up. So at the, if her fingers are down, then it'll be real thin around the fingers, and that's not really what we want it to do. So go ahead and do it again. And rotate your hand like that. Perfect. And do a couple more times. Very comfortable, isn't it? Yes. It's good. nice. One more. And then once we've got this going on, then all we're going to do to increase the, uh, the length of the therapy, we'll put this for hand in a wax bag. Put this like this and just wrap it around with a towel. And then she's free to just leave it like that for a while. And then she'll sit there for uh, 10 minutes and that's the end of the modality. But it's, once again, it's a great modality. Arthritis patients, patients uh, carpal tunnel, those kind of things. Works out very good. Okay, now we're going to kind of change things around a little bit. Uh, electrical modalities are not something you're going to find in the training room all the time. They're a lot more costly and you're going to have to have a little bit more information to use these things. Uh, they can either increase or decrease the blood flow. And once again, uh, our job as a clinician is to try to get those athletes back or those people back as fast as we can without hurting anybody. Make sure that you always follow the physician or the therapist's orders on any electrical modality that you run into. Make sure that the equipment is proper work in order and that it is plugged in. I can't tell you how many times I've like start a modality going and then forget to plug the stupid thing in. Make sure that you have uh, the circuit uh, is a ground fault interrupted. So in other words, that it's not going to end up shocking the patient. You do not want to hurt your patient. Explain the procedures to the patient. Make sure they understand what's going to happen. The worst thing in the world is you stick all this stuff on your patient and then you start turning this thing on and they jump off the table. Slow things down. Make sure that they understand what's going to happen with the electrical modality. And they're all a little bit different. You have to be able to expose the area that you're treating. Be very conscious of how the patient feels as far as having their body exposed in certain areas. Make sure that you clean the area that you're going to put the electrical modality on first. This can either be done with alcohol or soap or something like that before you put the electrical modalities on. Place the electrical modalities according to the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, every machine that comes out has a little bit of different kind of a deal that you have to be aware of. Avoid prolonged point contact with the use of an ultrasound. One of the worst things that I've ever seen with an electric modality is you have a tendency to put an ultrasound on somebody and then the next thing you know you're talking to the patient and you leave that ultrasound head right there and you can burn them. That's not a good idea, so we don't want to do those things. Once again, follow the manufacturer's instructions to use the equipment properly so that you wouldn't cause a burn or any type of further injury. Before you turn the, any of the electric modalities on, make sure that you turn the thing off completely before you turn it back on and make sure that you do whatever you can to make sure that the patient's skin is going to adhere to the patches. Sometimes you may have to shave the area. Leave the treatment area clean. Uh, when you're done, that's always without saying. The worst thing in the world is you have uh, a treatment area that looks like a bomb blew up right after you left. That's just inappropriate. Uh, to prevent infection, to ensure safety, uh, follow the manufacturer's instructions for cleaning the unit and make sure that you stay up and abreast on what you need to do with each individual unit as far as to keep it uh, the way it's supposed to be. Never use electric modality on an open wound. Open wound is very important. Our whole life changes as soon as something becomes open, and that's a problem. Do not use electric modalities on patients with a pacemaker without the approval of the physician. Can you imagine for one second you put that thing on there and all of a sudden the pacemaker stops? That would be kind of a bad thing. Uh, the electrical current may interfere with the uh, pacemaker and may cause it to stop, and that would be a problem. Okay, avoid high fluid areas of the body with electrical modalities. That, like we said before, because that could increase the swelling and that could make things worse. So we want to stay away from things like that. Avoid using electromodalities over the cardiac areas 
as it could change the patient's blood pressure and cause him or her to faint and that would not be a good thing either. Electric modalities should never be used on the trunk of a pregnant patient. Make sure that you ask the patient ahead of time if there's anything else that you need to be aware of. Uh, stop the treatment procedure if the patient starts to say anything about the treatment causes more pain. I've had uh, people that have worked for me before that the next thing you know is that the patient says it's starting to hurt, but then they don't go back and check and they just say, well, you're supposed to suck it up. Well, not necessarily so. That's not always the way that it works. Ultrasound is one of those uh, modalities that is widely, widely used and it works extremely well for tendonitis, bursitis, uh, hamstring strains, all those things. What it does, it helps to get more blood to the area. It's one of the deepest modalities that there is around. It's an excellent, excellent modality to use. Ultrasound is another one of those modalities we use all the time. Um, and we're going to have one of my student aides put it together for us today. Uh, there's two different ways that you can do it. You can use a regular gel or we have a phonophoresis. The, the difference is, is we put medication in here. What ultrasound does is it pushes sound waves into the body. So in other words, if you don't have the gel, it doesn't work. It's like taking the cord off between you and the TV set. So we'll go ahead and slap some of this stuff on here. Before we even did this, we went ahead and cleaned her uh, leg off so we don't have anything on top of it with a little bit of alcohol. We put a little bit of this stuff on here. We bring that baby up like this. We give this to Amanda. Now the skill is here is that you have to keep moving this thing. If you stop moving this, then their chances of burning a hole in that patient uh, have increased substantially. And we really don't want that to happen. And we'll talk more about ultrasound as we go through here. With this machine here, from here on over is ultrasound. From here on over on this side is interferential. We'll do both things. But today right now, we're going to go ahead and do a five minute program. Hit there. Now we're on and she knows we're on and she's moving it nice and slow right around the patella region. Take this up to 100%. Now we'll take this up to 1.5. Uh, 1.5 is the average kind of a treatment that we'll do for somebody. Um, if it gets too hot, we'll ask the patient if, they, if it gets too hot or they start to smell like a barbecue, then it's probably too hot. But other than that, we go ahead and leave it right about there for uh, our five-minute period. And one of the things we make sure that our student aide does is that this is one of those things you have to be here for five minutes, so you better get a conversation going with your patient. I always highly recommend that my student aides introduce themselves to the patient ahead of time, and we've already done that. Okay, now a kind of a little different kind of modality. It's electrical muscle stimulator or also a neuromuscular stimulator. They have big words for everything. Now, say, for example, we have a patient that comes back from surgery, and it's a knee injury like the picture shows here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place these electrical modalities or these electrical pads right over one of the muscles. The idea behind that is to try to help that muscle fire. Uh, say, for example, right after surgery, they just don't want to move that muscle anymore. Well, with this electrical uh, EMS, it will help fire that muscle, and it works out very, very good for that first part of rehab after surgery, or you're trying to work one specific muscle. Okay, another uh, modality is called a galvanic stimulator. Uh, once again, everything here will either increase or decrease the blood flow. You have the ice, you have the heat, now you have the galvanic stem. Now one of the things that you look at for this is there's a positive polarity and a, and a negative polarity. The negative polarity causes a vasoconstriction. Now what is a vasoconstriction? Uh, vasoconstriction is what you use with ice. In other words, that everything constricts down. Whereas a vasodilation, which you use on the positive pole, that's also a form of heat that will increase the blood flow. Uh, you use them for different things. So in other words, a negative polarity, we'd go ahead and use that right after they sprain their ankle or their knee. And then later on, if they have like a sore back, we'll go ahead and put it on the positive pol polarity. Great modality. Another modality that's around a lot right now is called an interferential INF. If this thing works very good for, once again, to increase or decrease the circulation depending on how you set the thing up from the very beginning. So let's go ahead and see how the modality works on this. Now what we're going to do is uh, do the interferential. Uh, with these, we use these pads. We'll have either the black pads or the red pads, and they, they may adjust differently with different machines. Sometimes they will have a tendency to dry out, and then what you'll do is you just go ahead, and this is a spray made specifically for that. You put it right on the pad, or, you know, you could just use water. And we'll do each one of those, but we'll just go ahead and spray this stuff right on there like that. Kind of nice touch there. 
Once again, we've got a lot of bad knees here today. This is another one of those bad knees. We have a little bit of uh, tendonitis here. So Amanda's going to go ahead and set this thing up. And what you want to do on interferential, interferential means interference. So that means we have an interference current. So we're going to have the black ones here. And this is for a general knee kind of in inflammation is what we're setting this up for. So what goes on is the black pads have their current going this way and the red pads have their current going this way. And so once again, everything here either increases or decreases the blood flow. And this is all we're going to do here is we'll go ahead and set up the power switch. And on this machine, like we saw before with the ultrasound, is from this side over is the ultrasound. Here is how you adjust the intensity of the ultrasound. This is where you adjust the watts, watts cube. And it's either 20, 50, or 100% of what you put out for the ultrasound. This is just for the timer specifically. And most generally, we're going to go, Amanda, what we do, about 15 minutes, I think, on these things. So we're going to leave 15. These knobs on this side over are all for their interferential. So we'll take it down to zero to begin with. We'll go ahead and take this to 80. 150, hit the start button, and then I'll go ahead and let her adjust this up. Go ahead and take this up as much as you want to for Kayla. And it's real easy to, to tell because there'll be some kind of a verbal response when it gets too high. You can feel it. You can feel it? Yeah. And if you turn this up very high, and you can just see this just for demonstration pur purposes, it'll contract the muscles in her quadricep. Isn't that key? Um, the patients don't like it to go up that high, but for us, just to show you that that's really the wrong thing to do, um, and that's mainly what we showed that for. But other than that, it's, uh, how would you explain this? This kind of makes you feel like your leg's going to sleep, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes you feel all tingly. Kind of tingly, kind of tingly all over. Uh, but it, it works really good. The other thing we'll do with this, we can either stick it an ice bag on top of it. This way, what we do with the ice bag, and I'm sorry we don't have Jenna here for the ice, is that the the blood is moving in there, but the blood, we don't want it to stay. We want the blood to go through, but not stay there. So that's the idea behind the eyes. Incredible modality and great for uh, many kind of um, tendonitis, bursitis, inflammation kind of thing. We're going to go ahead right now and go straight to the ionophoresis. This is an, another excellent modality that we use every day. We're going to do an ionophoresis treatment. And what ionophoresis is, it's an anti-inflammatory medication that we put into a pad, a pad chair, and normally we use um, dexamethasone. There are other anti-inflammatory medications you can use, but dexamethasone is the primary medication. We're going to put the medication into this patch, and through a direct current and direct electrical current, the uh, medication is going to be driven into her skin. It doesn't actually go through the, the circulatory system. It actually is a localized treatment. Okay. So show me where you're having your pain. Right there. Right there. And tell me where it's tender. Right there. Right in there? OK. So I'm going to place some medication onto this patch. And depending on how big your patch is depends on how much medication you're using. We're using the smallest patch. So we use 1 and 1 half cc's of this medication. And I'm going to use all dexamethasone. Sometimes you can dilute it with saline. If you don't want to use um, that strong of a medication, you can do um, diluting it with a little bit of saline. But we're going to use just straight dexamethasone. And you want to make sure you have good contact to the skin. So we use an alcohol swab to wipe off any lotions or oils or any sweat. Have you been running around sweating? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're going to swab the area that you're going to place the patch with the medicine, and that's generally the area where they're having their tenderness or their pain. And then you're going to find a nice, big, muscular surface to attach your ground pad. It could be here, we're going to use the quad. Um, it could be the calf. You could actually use the opposite limb. It really just depends on your preference. I'm just going to make sure that it's dry here so we get it nice and sticky. I'm going to turn it on. And you may feel something, and what you may feel is like a little pin pricking, almost like you're being stuck with a little needle or like a little bee sting. Or you may not feel anything at all. Some people don't feel anything. You may feel it here, you may feel it here, or you may not feel anything. Okay? I want you to take it up as high as you can. Okay? So what I'm going to do, I'll turn it on, and you can say, okay, I'm starting to feel it. 
then I'm going to keep turning it up. And I want you to say, okay, you know what, stop there. I don't really want to take any more. The only um, really reaction we can have from this is a little bit of a skin burn. And what you'll see is just a little red area right around where I take the patch off. And that normally lasts about an hour. Usually goes away after that. If we don't pay attention to how the patient's feeling and we turn it up too high, you can get a little bit more of a skin burn and you'll get kind of like a blister formation and that kind of stays with you for a few days. So do be aware of how it's feeling. If it starts to feel like it's getting too strong, say, okay, Kim, you know what, go ahead and stop right there. Okay? Okay, I've turned it on, so tell me if you feel anything. Tell me when it's, if you don't want me to go any higher, okay? okay? And we may not get to that point, you may be able to take it all the way or we may have to stop. It's really up to your tolerance. Right there is good. Okay. So we'll leave it right there. And the treatment's going to go for about 20 minutes. Okay? The higher that you take it up, the less time you have to take with the treatment. Okay? But 20 minutes is fine. That's fine if that's how it's feeling. Okay? So you'll be on that for about 20 minutes. And then after when I'm done with the treatment, when I'm going to go actually do my note, um, I actually come into my computer here and I open up Jenna's chart and I can actually type in what I've just done and I can write in that I did iontophoresis to her patellar tendon on the left side and what I used dexamethasone, iontophoresis and um, she's at 2.0 milliamps for 20 minutes and that's how I would log it into my computer here. Okay, okay another uh, kind of an interesting modality is that you have somebody that has constant pain, a constant back pain uh, and this is where you get into this TENS. The idea behind the TENS is you'll put that right on the area where it hurts the most and then through the electrical current it will help to decrease the pain and it will kind of numb the air. It's a very great modality. Another thing we're going to look at right now is neuro re-education and this is kind of a post-surgery, post-injury thing that we'll use to try to get the patient to work the muscles. Let's go ahead and talk to Kim who is a physical therapist and a certified athletic trainer and she'll explain how this all works. What we're going to do today is some neuromuscular re-education of the quadriceps VMO complex. Okay? The VMO is the most inner quadricep muscle. We're going to use two different devices to do this re-education. The first device we're going to use is called an empty focus unit and it is a neuromuscular re-education electrical stimulation. And there's a lot of different ones on the market so you don't necessarily, necessarily have to use MP's unit. Um, so we're going to place the pads over her VMO. So we place one pad and then the other. We're using two pads. Some units use four pads. Um, but today for this demonstration we're just using two just over her uh, VMO muscle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on, okay, and I okay. want you to tell me when you start to feel it. What you're going to feel is a little bit of tingling, okay. It's probably going to feel really a little bit strong because what we're doing is we're putting this on those neuro end points, mm -hmm. okay, and it's going to kind of tighten your muscle up. That's what we want to do, okay, because what we're trying to do is get this muscle to fire again, okay. This is commonly used for people who've had surgery or somebody who's had an injury and has been immobilized for a long period of time and um, their quadricep has gotten really, really weak. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it on. Here we go. Tell me when you feel it, okay? Keep taking it up as high as you can, but tell me when you don't think you can take any more. Good, right there. good, good. And as we can see, her muscles starting to grab a little bit with the machine, okay? And what it's gonna do, it's gonna contract for five seconds, and then it's gonna relax for five seconds. So now we've relaxed and we'll show it contracting again. And now it's starting to contract and you can see it grabbing her muscle. And what I would have you do is some quadricep exercises. So what I want you to do right now, wait till the machine goes off. Wait till it comes back on and I want you to go ahead and tighten along with the machine. So tighten your quadricep. Yeah, good. Really pull it in, push down into the table. Good. Hold that while the machine's on. And when the machine goes off, you can relax. Good. Okay, so we'd have her do a series of quadriceps exercises. Right now she's doing what we call a quad set. Then I'd move her to maybe a straight leg raise, a short arc quad. Okay, good. So that's one machine we can use. Now as they progress and they get a little bit better, we can use a biofeedback machine, which is a little bit different machine, but I'll go ahead and demonstrate that as well. 
going to do another neuro reeducation machine. This is called the MyoTrack. Again, we're using this for the quadriceps muscle and the VMO complex. The VMO, we're going to be working on the inner muscle right here. Okay. What I'm going to do is put this machine on her, and this machine is actually called a biofeedback machine. What it's going to do is it's going to track how hard she is actually firing or contracting this VMO muscle. So there we can see a nice VMO. I'm going to stick the sensor right over the VMO, okay? And then I'm going to fasten it on with a strap. You want it nice and snug. You want it to stay right against the VMO. Go ahead and tighten up again. Bring your toes up. Yeah, there you go. Good. Good. And relax. Go ahead and let it relax all the way. So when she's relaxed, it's in the green. So when you're relaxing, you're going to be in the green here. Go ahead and tighten that quad again by pushing down. You'll see the little sensor move into the yellow. And that's where I want you to stay. I want you to have it in the yellow. And I want you to hold it there till it beeps. So now you can relax. And that's how you do the exercise. Good. And I can make the sensitivity harder for her. So if I turn the sensitivity up a little bit, she's going to have to contract a little harder. And it might take a little longer for it to beep. Good. Is that harder for you? Good. Relax. Good. And we can move on and do straight leg raises with this. We could do thigh squeezes. And we could also do short, short arc quads. OK, uh, now we're going to kind of switch again. Another kind of type of modality is traction. How many of you have ever seen any kind of traction? When I first saw traction, I thought, well, this is going to make me that seven-foot center I always wanted to be. That way I can go out and make those big bucks. But in reality, that's not what it's for. Say, for example, you have some type of an injury that you have your two vertebrae, right? And then in between the vertebrae, vertebrae you have these nerves going through. The idea behind the traction is it's going to distract those two vertebrae so that will help to kind of... Um, maybe even allow the nerves to kind of relax a little bit in there so they'll have a little bit more space. Uh, it's a very great thing to use as far as with a lot of back injuries. If you look at this picture, this is one way that we do traction. This is on a traction table. We put the legs up. This makes the back a little bit flatter and then we, we pull from the waist one way and the shoulders the other way. They use traction for low back injuries. We, we lose traction for upper, uh, upper back or neck injuries. It's an excellent, excellent modality with a lot of good uses. But make sure, once again, that you check with your physician uh, on how to use it. Make sure that you check with the manufacturers. Make sure that you're doing things correctly. Uh, this is one of those things, once again, with all modalities, even if an ice pack, that you could really hurt somebody, and you don't want to do that. Now, massage. Massage is probably not used enough anymore. It's one of those things, it's a hands-on kind of a thing that really can help people out. It's a systematic method of uh, applying friction, kneading, kind of working the muscles around so that it will adhere more blood flow to the area. There's a couple different types of massage out there. One's called effleurage. This is a stroking of the skin with the palms of your hands. You've all seen this someplace or another. Uh, another one is petrocise. This is lifting uh, lifting and kneading the skin. So it's almost like you're, uh, you have dough, you have uh, bread, and you're kind of kneading it. Uh, works out very, very good. Uh, deep friction, this is where you take, uh, you go right along maybe the, the elbow or you find some spot and you go back and forth. All these things, what they'll do is they'll increase the blood flow to that area. There's a lot of training. A good massage has a lot of training and they, they practice a lot. It's one of those things. Uh, uh, trampoline, this is where you take a gentle tapping over like the hamstrings or the back. And once again, the idea behind this is to increase the blood flow to that area. Uh, vibration, uh, you'll see these things all the time. You go to a smarter image or one of those places and you sit in one of those chairs. How many of you have done that one time or another and you left, Phil, and this is a wonderful experience. Uh, it's a great, great thing to use. All these different massage techniques are very good. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at uh, what I call thinking it through. This was a second half of a North uh, Poly girls basketball game. While grabbing a rebound, Leah, foot landed on Emily's foot, causing Leah to fall. Vic, the athletic trainer, went to Leah's aid immediately. Still on the floor, Leah was rocking back and forth in pain and holding her ankle. Vic, the athletic trainer, grabbed her up, took her to the training room, where that they could evaluate the ankle better. Uh, after helping her to the training room, Vic took Leah's both shoes off so he could evaluate the injuries. Got to look at the good side and the bad side. Leah was still in a lot of pain. Uh, his first thought was she probably sprained it. 
Uh, Vic made the immediate use of the appropriate therapeutic modalities, which you think would be in that case. He also talked to the team doctor, which was Dr. Wall, for a diagnosis. Dr. Wall came in and examined the ankle. He suspected, once again, it was a sprain, but he ordered x-rays to rule out the possible fracture because too many times you can have a thing called a stress fracture. So they transported Leah to the, the local clinic. Uh, they looked at the films. Dr. Wall concluded that the injury was indeed just a sprain. Just a sprain doesn't mean just a sprain. And somewhere between the first and second degree as far as the injury itself. He said Leah would probably be out for anywhere from one to two weeks. Uh, Leah immediately freaked out, as all players do. I got to play today, I got to play tomorrow, play us in two weeks, what is she going to do? So now the coach walks in, she's all concerned now, everybody wants her to play. Uh, so they, they looked and they told their concerns to both Dr. Wall and Vic, the certified athletic trainer. So now is when you come in. So what type of modality would you use for Leah? Uh, what are the concerns that you would have for her? Uh, why did you take both shoes off rather than just one? Um, what, would, what are the modalities she's going to use the first three days? What are the modalities she's going to use after that? Uh, what are the other things you're going to bring in right now to ensure that Leah can have that, that opportunity to play in the playoffs? Let's think about that for a second. Right off the get-go, we have a first-degree ankle sprain, first or second-degree ankle sprain. We're going to go right to the ice compression elevation. So we're going to use our ice 20 minutes, off an hour, ice 20 minutes, off an hour, ice 20 minutes, off an hour. We're going to add the elevation above the heart. Uh, after we do that, we're going to go ahead and put elastic wrap around it. And then we're going to probably put her on crutches. When we put her on crutches, we're going to make sure that her toes stay up to make sure that we stretch off and stretch the Achilles. Uh, we might even, if we have access, we might use the uh, compression of the game ready. So then we go ahead and we have the kneading effect pushing that out. So that's going to work until the swelling has completely subsided. So that's anywhere from, you know, two to four days. During this time, we make sure that the only thing that's hurt is her ankle. Everything else, she's still working out. She's still shooting the foul shots. She's still doing everything she possibly can to make sure that when she goes back to play, that she is going to be the athlete she was before she went to play. Then we go to the contrast phase, which is the 30 seconds of cold, two minutes of warm, back and forth. And then we're getting close to game four. Then we use the blue notonics, and we go to all those things along with that. So your job as the athletic uh, trainer or the physical therapist is to make sure that these athletes get back to play as soon as they can without hurting them. Now what I'm going to, the, the thing that we look at a lot of times is that people have a tendency to rush to judgment. Let's try the surgery. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull one of my uh, athletes in here, and I'm going to show you what you don't want to do. Too many times what occurs with me is that a patient will come in and the mom and dad will come in and they say, hey, we got to get, we got to get them back as soon as we can and we want surgery, we want surgery tomorrow. But what you have to understand is that too many times you may have somebody that, you know, they, they run to the knife. We, we don't want them to run to the knife, sure. And, and that we don't want that to occur. So we just tell them these are the problems that we run into. So in other words, it's this thing here. Melissa, poor Melissa, had a little bit of a, a sore throat. And so what we're going to work with is her parents came in and they said, hey, we got to try some surgery because she's got to play on Friday. She has to play. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and try to cut that part out. You okay with this, Melissa? You okay? And we just get in there and we kind of cut that out. Oh, we got to cut, 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 cut. Oh, and then bring it back in. And then. She does feel better now because as you can see, your throat's all better now, the pain's gone away, and all we had to do is we just took that sword right there. So once again, have fun with modalities, make sure you choose the right modality, and don't rush to judgment with surgery. Thanks.